let's rock and roll. Improv. We just love it. Hello and welcome to the sixth episode of For the Love of Improv, where we talk everything improv and why we love it and all the good stuff. We are your hosts. I am Jesse Wicks. I'm Katie Welsh. And today we have the fabulous, the amazing, the one and only Courtney Rapp on us on <laughs> on the podcast. Not on us, but on the podcast today. <laughs> oh, Ow, now, brown cow. <laughs> Getting used Are you to warming this. Warming up. Warming up. Okay. <laughs> today, our talk. You had, you had tea today, didn't you, instead of coffee? I did. Oh, boy. There's, that's why. It's a whole thing. We. <laughs> this is about improv, not about my coffee habits, but the coffee was a whole thing. Today, our topic is um, finding what the scene needs. So, if you are in one of those <laughs> scenes, like. Courtney's going to help us figure out what's in our tool bag to uh, get that scene back on track today. This is going to be a very, very useful episode. You're going to get so much. I'm going to put all the pressure on Courtney because yeah, this is going to be the best episode ever. Right, Courtney? I'm right. sweating. <laughs> the responsibility is overwhelming right now. All right. Before we get started, why don't you, um, you tell them about how we're not experts? Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't know anything, but we try to learn on this mm-hmm. show. Uh, no, right. you know, we, we've been doing improv for a short time, uh, and so... Long compared we, to some people. Yeah, it just I depends. Mean, it's all relative, but, you know, like a couple years. Um, uh-oh, somebody forgot to turn their cell phone off. Rude. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we don't claim to be experts, but we love improv, and we love learning about improv, we love talking about improv, and we love inviting people on our show to lend their knowledge and experience and uh yeah but so come along with us on our improv journey journey. (laughs) Journey. that is improv anyway so um courtney has been doing improv for what about 11 years now Uh, about 18 18 years yeah on and off well yeah pants over here i think you are very i mean i don't want to i'm 32 i i own your age women own your age and your beauty yeah I mean, you didn't seem like the type of person that cared, but no. I Cor- just turned forty-five, so good on you. Yeah. Got the good Don't even look at yeah. Just a little. You're welcome. Um, Courtney is a local creative. She is an amazing photographer, both video um, and still photography. She just did a play called "Let the Right One In," where she was the star role vampire. It was amazing. Uh, what else do you got in the works? What, what else is going on in your life, Courtney? Um, well, quite a few things. Just uh, I'm getting ready in two weeks to go to Europe for a month and a half. <laughs> so I'm very excited about that. Yeah, I take a month off a year to relax, chill, sort of regroup my creative spirits, you know, Jealous. align all of the stars, but from the other side of the world. Um, and then I'm also writing a pilot episode with a previous guest on the show, Taylor Riedemann, and we're really excited about um, getting the production up and going for that. Um, so good yeah, just a lot of random stuff. Show. Yeah, she was amazing. Yeah. yeah. yeah she she did the character building one. Mm-hmm. It was... Yeah. Oh, go back and listen to Taylor Riedemann episode two. Yeah, she does some fun characters on there. <laughs> good stuff. Mm-hmm. So, um, I'm just going to, you know, get the juices flowing here, ask a few silly questions. Um, Courtney, what is your spirit animal? An elephant. What? Yeah. It's really funny because you're like so small. Like, <laughs> like if you guys want to take a picture and put it online, like she's she's very petite. Yeah. Um. I'm I'm actually I've never really, ne- haven't really been a big fan of animals in general. Really? Um. I find them tedious and a lot of responsibility <laughs> that I don't have. Um, but I did spend two weeks in Thailand working with rescued elephants. Um, and, uh, we just really bonded because they only care about eating Mm -hmm. and chilling. They move slow. Mm -hmm. They're all about that relaxed lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're also very protective of like their herd and their people. Um, and it's a very, they're very, uh, clingy to their like groups. Um, and so 
just sort of experiencing and being around elephants for two weeks, I'm like, these are my, these are my, these are my animals. Nice. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So. Yeah. You, you are very clingy. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, okay. So um, one question we ask all of our guests. Very first, so this is 18 years ago, so this is, you were pretty young. But Oh, I remember. The very first time you walked into an improv class, what did you feel? Why did you come back? So I was in high school, and at the time, I had just started uh, volunteering, working at a community theater in Texas, and I was assisting, I was the assistant director for, um, like, a kid's workshop, and we were going to play improv games and I was like what is this improv thing and it we basically played freeze tag um but as the high schooler slash assistant director I had to be in every single scene and start every single scene with the kids like they would yell freeze and then a new kid would come in and then I would have to be in every single scene and um it was at that time in my life my dad was deployed um 9-11 had just happened and um I was a very shy kid I always stayed in my room I I like puzzles you know whatever kind of thing was like I don't like working with people um but improv was sort of that thing that got me out of my shell Mm -hmm. and I recognized that I was really good at it it was something that I was actually good at doing um and so from that point on I was like this is my life and I have basically integrated improv into every conversation everything that I do so she has never had a conversation since that did not in some way involve him true story I I think that's so true because uh you know a lot of people will be like oh oh you do improv oh I could never do something like that and it's like you know, it's it's sometimes those people who have the most social anxiety or are the shyest where I want to be like, no, actually, you of all people should try it because it, it, it'll do amazing things for you. Absolutely. I mean, every time you have a conversation with someone, I mean, as much yeah. as this episode is planned, like it's right. improvised because we're having a conversation mm-hmm. and I don't know what's going to come out of your mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just I think I think ultimately it's can you communicate in a braver stance than normal right. is pretty much I think what improv helps you to Absolutely. accomplish yeah yeah I definitely I definitely think improv helps you with the art of conversation because there is an art to it and Absolutely. Way mm-hmm. to speak to people to sort of draw things out from them and also listening is a big part of improv and that's also a big part of conversing with people and all of that stuff so mm-hmm. all right. you shy people out there try improv <laughs> I actually ha- never had a, a problem with talking. I was yeah. I was always good at that, but um, I did have a problem with listening. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> good one. Um. <clears throat> okay, people, let's jump into our topic. All right. Okay. Let's do um, it. Let's see. Okay. Um, what are we talking about today? What, I'm going to go ahead and set her up with um, kind of a concept, and we'll talk about this concept, because this is, and then Courtney can kind of go in and talk about what the need is in a scene when it falls flat, and yeah. why a lot of scenes fall flat. Um, but the concept I want to talk about is point of view. Mm. Um, I'm reading my notes here. P-O-V. P-O-V. Point yeah. Of view. <laughs> right. Um, Isn't that like an STD or something? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you never know what's going to come out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, A little nervous now. <laughs> um, the hardest thing is sticking to your point of view. This is something Courtney said to me. Um, why do you feel sticking to your point of view is the hardest thing in an improv scene? Well, I think um, a scene moves and changes throughout and people's um things that people say change and so I think a lot of times we when we're in a scene we think we need to follow Mm -hmm. everything that's happening and you do in a way and that's part of listening is you know following conceptually um but I think a lot of people in general as human beings we're we don't like conflict and so we tend to agree a lot more than we should 
Um, but if you're in a scene where you think that that painting is ugly and someone comes in and starts describing why it's beautiful and all this other stuff, there's no reason for you to agree with them right away. The painting's ugly and that can create something beautiful from a scene. Right. Um, before, So this, uh, I feel like we're kind of jumping, you know, m- main rule of improv is agree, agree, agree. Right. But you can still agree that that painting exists and that you're looking at the same painting without agreeing uh, that it's beautiful or not beautiful. Right. I mean, you can still be when I think when when you say agree in a scene, it's more agreeing with the reality. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because you say that the painting is beautiful, um, I can agree with your reality of thinking that that painting is beautiful. Mm -hmm. But my point of view might be different within that reality. Mm -hmm. Um, So I can come in and be like, well, I don't know. I think whoever did this was, you know, on drugs and they don't actually know what they're doing or find out it's actually painted by a three year old and they actually have no talent whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm not going to be I'm not going to come up to you and be like, no, you don't think that painting is beautiful. I'm not changing your point of view. Mm -hmm. I'm just changing. I'm having a different point of view, but staying in agreement in the reality of the scene. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think, too, you can also apply that to, like, say, if somebody comes on stage and you haven't yet defined what sort of role you are, like, whether you're a child or a parent or, you know, an art critic critic or something like that, you know? So if somebody comes on and, like, if you're coming in there thinking, well, I'm an art critic, and then somebody comes on and says, Johnny, where have you been? I've been looking for you for so long, like, you know, as if you're a child... Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to, again, change your point of view. You can still be a child, but say, well, I think that painting is ugly. Or, you know, maybe mm-hmm. there's some mannerisms that you brought on stage with you, too, and you can still keep those, but sh- sort of pivot into that new defined role. Right. Right. And I think um, where a lot of scenes lose steam, and I know I've been there and I've actually done this before, <laughs> um, is when you feel this need to change your point of view because you feel pulled in a certain direction by someone and then it all you almost end up negating yourself you know you negate your own reality and things that you said before no longer make sense because you're trying to be this different character that somebody else set you up as Mm -hmm. um you know so if somebody if you come in like slouching and somebody says you look so happy today Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) you could you know you you have you still have the power to turn that into whatever you know maybe that's Maybe that's your way of expressing happiness. Yeah, maybe your way of, yeah. And that's a great piggyback on episode two with Taylor Riedemann. (laughs) (laughs) Taylor's getting the plug today. Ayo. Um, So at what point do you change your point of view? Um, I think you can, when you're in a scene, I think you can sense when something is being overdone or getting stale or... um, You know, it's like when resolved. Yeah. Like when something feels complete within that, Mm -hmm. um, I think that those are great moments. And it's just a sense that I don't think there's any kind of hard rule because it can happen 20 seconds into a scene. It can happen two minutes into a scene where you feel like, okay, this is not really going anywhere. I have nothing else to add to this thing. Um, Or you can pick something that somebody said and you can that can change an emotion it can change your point of view if you feel like it's strong enough um i i like changing in a scene um whenever i feel like it's sort of becoming a dud um just because it gives something fresh and new to whatever it is that you're discussing or talking about and i prefer using um a gift from my partner something that they're saying almost to um, trip up their character's point of view, not them as a person, but like if, if, uh, like yeah. we were in a scene, Jesse and I were in a scene together and I had made a, she had made a comment about like, um, well, you, you know, you could be the best tomato thrower in the world here. I'm going to give you a chance. And I was like, man, it, it's crazy. Cause I would have thought that you'd read my diary to know that this was like my heart's cry. And she was like, I did read your diary and it just, (laughs) and then I use that to be, to now it's not about the tomato throwing. It's not about my passion. Now it's about the fact that my sister just read my diary. And so that, so much there now. Mm -hmm. So 
it's all about listening. You really have to pay attention and listen. And it's not about, you know, your personal point of view. It's about your character's point of view, which are two completely different things. Well, and two, I, I think, too, like, um, that just reminded me, and I don't know how much it relates to what we're talking about in general. But, um, you know, like, when a character might say, like, don't touch me, I don't like to be touched. Um, then the pers- the other person on stage, it's like, they're going to touch them now. Like, that's... <laughs> that's what they're going to do because that's going to create that sort of conflict and it's not denying them. It's, 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 you know, it's creating that conflict of, of like, Ooh, what's going to happen now? Cause now they're being touched and how is that person going to react? And, you know, um, I don't know if that's a change necessarily, but it's, um, it's just leaning into that, that conflict and, and therefore enriching the scene. Well, I think it's it's when you hear something like that, recognizing what your choices are in that moment. So so they've given you a bit of information, a gift, knowing, okay, this character doesn't like to be touched. You know, are you going to just kind of blow, okay, you don't like to be touched, I won't touch you. Yeah, or you can be like, it. oh, this is now a part of the scene and now I can play into that. And it's rec- recognizing gifts, I think, is an important yeah. thing. Um, well, yeah, totes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, beyond point of view, you're in a scene and you just feel like it's a dud. You get that moment when you're on scene and you just froze and you're like, shit, this scene sucks. How do I get out of it? Um, what what is the first tool that comes to your mind when you're like, okay, I got to just bring something to this scene. The scene needs something right now. What is your first instinct? Well, my first instinct is to ask myself, have we established a relationship yet? Mm. Um, And I find that a lot of scenes become duds because you haven't established that relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, Because if there's a relationship that already exists, the scene most likely won't fall flat. Um, so that's my first thing is, have I given this person a name? Have I established the, who they are to me? Have they established who they are? Have they established it to me and have I not recognized it? And do I need to address that? Um, so that, that's the first thing that, that I do. Right. Yeah. So is the relationship simply like who we are to each other or is there something else involved in creating that relationship? Well, I th- the first step is who we are to each other. Mm-hmm. And then what I sort of do very quickly in a millisecond is establish, okay, what does that relationship mean mm-hmm. to me? And that creates emotions. It creates perspective. It creates a point of view. It creates all of these other things, how I would react to this person. Okay, so if you're my sister, do we have a good relationship or a bad relationship? Are we jealous of one another or we do this or whatever? And so I kind of run through all of these scenarios. I pick one. And then I go with that. And if I have a partner on stage with me who I can trust and is doing the same thing, they're going to create their point of view. And that's going to, no matter what we talk about, whether we talk about socks or whether we talk about going to college, there's going to be something meaty there Mm -hmm. because of the relationship that we've developed. I think it's fun, too. Like, I don't know what you think about this, Courtney, but um, (laughs) sometimes uh, I find myself introducing an emotion before I define the relationship and then just kind of see where it goes and then after a few lines back and forth to each other from there decide that okay we're this you know we're brother and sister or we're mom and dad or whatever like that so I feel like there's different ways to you can you can what do you think about that I I Mm -hmm. tend to go into scenes like that anyway Mm -hmm. um, because I feel like your emotion will drive the scene way more than your relationship will. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of times that emotion can help you figure out what your relationship is and become more creative in what that relationship is. Because people tend to fall into family relationships or cousins or boyfriend, girlfriend, which are cool. But like, what if you're my boss and we work at a meatpacking plant? Like how, okay, but how our, how we come into a scene emotionally might actually drive and define that. Um, I'm a very slow scene improviser, <laughs> much like how I said that 
sentence. Um, so what does that mean? Could you maybe flesh that out a little bit? What, what is the difference? Because I think that's, um, I think that that is something like that I know that I've discovered, like, I, I've noticed like some people are, I noticed that I go too fast. And so actually I'm, I'm very interested in learning how to slow down. Um, but there's some people who like, like, I know, I know Ben, Ben likes to, Ben Craig likes to, you know, he likes, he yeah, likes he's a fast to, mover. He wants things to happen, happen. And I get, yeah. I kind of get both sides. Like I can see the value in both. Yeah. I think, I think going to our topic of what a scene needs, um, it's, it's really creating the versatility in yourself as a player to recognize, okay, this scene needs to be a little bit slower mm. and, and trusting your instinct to actually move slower. Mm -hmm. um, or coming into a scene and being like, there's a lot of high energy here. Mm. So I need to move a little bit faster. My words need to come out a little bit more. I need to be a little bit more creative in the way that I communicate with it. And then my movements are going to go right behind that. And then, you know, you don't, you don't know. So, um, so, I think that what was your question? <laughs> no, you're doing good. I was just asking to kind of flesh out what what the difference is between playing slow and playing fast. I mean, I also noticed that like part of when when I play fast, it's because I'm nervous. Mm. And so to me, that's not like that. Con I'm not being a conscientious enough player because I'm just, uh, you know, like so. I think I think a way to remedy that. Um, and I know Jesse and I have talked about this is we replace uh, time on stage with just doing something. And so we think that by doing something, that means speaking. Um, so if you're not speaking, do something, mm -hmm. pace, walk around, find something to do, wash the dishes, mow the lawn, I don't know, carve whittle, do something. Um, because that is as much of a gift as saying something to your scene partner. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of coming on stage with someone and we don't speak for like 60 seconds mm -hmm. um, because me doing a motion, an, an action and them doing an, an action are going to create a really beautiful scene versus coming on and being like, sup, bro. Mm -hmm. Hey, bro, what's up? Mm -hmm. Like that, that can be funny and it can be great, but like. Um, yeah, but oftentimes people, like you said, like they, they don't think about actions being starting the scene but it, it, and people are nervous about the audience like you're not boring the audience mm -hmm. so get that out of your head mm -hmm. the audience is there and they're going to be they're entertained they're they are curious about what's happening on stage and because there's not a lot of slow improv i think people are going to enjoy and be more intrigued by slow improv than quick improv because it's like oh here's something new and it's like oh i don't really know what to think right now mm -hmm. yeah What's gonna happen? Mm. <laughs> um, I'm going. I'm going to pause right there, and we're going to move into our first segment, which is our concept of the day. And today, I picked like a really basic one because I feel like when scenes go bad, sometimes it's basically fundamentals. It's the last page. Um, the fundamentals. Are, are what's struggling yeah um mm, yeah and so the concept today um i got from the dallas comedy house you can go to dallascomedyhouse.com um their blog on the five principles in um, of improv that will improve your life um and i took this one that I, I liked what they said about it it's listen and respond um there's there's a game that we play where we basically go around in a circle and it's the expert game. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to take, you're supposed to physically say a word from what the person said before and then expound on it. So you're giving expert advice about a specific topic and you go around and someone says, um, you know, tables um, were invented to actually be chairs. And the next person would be like, yes, originally tables were chairs and, and, until that defining moment when they realized they could set a cup on it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and you keep going. Yes. That first cup that was set on a table, you, you know, and you go around saying you listen to the last words that were said and then you respond to that. Like you don't have to have context from the whole scene. You just have to have context from the last thing the person said. So the Dallas comedy house says, this is the most fundamental concept of conversation yet it's often the most difficult we get stuck in our heads thinking of what we'll say next 
that and so we miss key information that can propel the conversation or the improv scene so stop worrying so much about what you are going to say and do or how you are going to be received instead start listening for the gifts being given to you and respond in like kind um <laughs> one of the it reminds me because one of the um one of the an exercise that uh, i've done before um which it's a pretty boring improv exercise but um is basically all it is is that somebody is a customer in a restaurant and the other person is a waiter and then so the person who's the customer you know, gives their order and the waiter's job is to repeat back the order. And kind of as the customer, the idea is that you kind of make the most complicated order ever so that the person is really forced to really intently listen to you. And it's a hyper focus exercise on <laughs> what it means to listen, because I think that, you know, we I think a lot of people do just are like oh what funny thing am I gonna say next like they're they're in our, their head and instead of you know I think the focus most of the time should be on your scene partner or the other people in the scene or whatever if somebody walks on stage you know listening is also just pay, it just means paying attention if somebody walks on on stage you know you have to pay attention to now there's another person <clears throat> on stage so yeah and I and I don't think that um, I think that's really great to. Um, cause we're not going to remember everything. Yep. And I, so I think it's a really great exercise to utilize because what I do is, um, people give a lot of information and what I'll do is I'll be like, Ooh, that's really important. I'm going to hold on to that. Oh, that's really important too. I'm going to hold on to that. So then I have like two or three concepts or ideas that have been brought onto stage or spoken that I'm holding on to and putting into my little memory box, um, because if you can't remember, it's fine. It's improv. Like, that's part of the, the humor and the fun is like, hey, George, and be like, my name's Jack. And be like, well, it's George now, you know. And so <laughs> things like that, whatever. Yeah. But um, but that's one thing that I do in the course of a whole game is I'll be listening intently for, like, those nuggets and I want to hold on to and sort of bring back later or I want to respond to later. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, too, um, you know, it's always okay because sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't hear what somebody says like you, you know, and you're trying to listen and you don't hear. Um, and I think it's also okay to be like, what'd you say? Or do an active listening thing and say, did you just say blah, 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 blah. And then the person can be like, no, I said this or yes, aren't you listening to it? whatever, you know, it's, or sometimes it's just bad timing. Like, mm -hmm. uh, our show on Saturday, uh, Jesse, different Jesse, was driving a hearse. And so for when they came back to the other scene, I came on stage to be in the hearse. And as soon as I came on stage and laid down, he says, I got a new tractor. And so now I'm like, <laughs> now it's a tractor hearse, you know? So it's... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so... Yeah. So it's okay. It's okay, you guys. It doesn't have to be perfect. It can be a tractor <laughs> but I mean, that's funny. That's what makes yeah, it interesting absolutely. is that we are making, we are human. We are making mistakes. And I think that's what the audience loves is that, yeah. oh, it's a tractor hearse. Okay. This right. is interesting. And would not, what, what would be not as okay. I mean, everything's okay. It's okay. Everything. You know, it is. <laughs> but um, what's not as okay <laughs> is if, um, you know, Jesse said, oh, it's a tractor. And then Courtney ignores that and argues and denies and said, no, it's a, it's a hearse. Right. No, it's, it's, you, you have to not, you have to agree because the audience will pick up on that and go, well, wait a minute. Yeah. And then that's, that's a chance for you to lose the audience because now they're sitting there thinking about like, well, wait a minute, is it tractor or a hearse or like what's going on? And they get confused and then they don't, they're not engaged in the scene anymore. Yeah. They're no longer invested. Right. Yeah. So, well. So listening and responding, you guys do it. Yeah, do own that. it. Just do it. Part of it. Um, so uh, this is something that I have trouble with because when I decide I want to help a scene, I just want to go in there and help a scene. Um, but how can you tell when a scene actually needs your help or it just needs to be allowed to be played out longer? Mm. That's hard. Yeah, I think this is one of the hardest concepts for new improvisers is like, when do I edit? When do I bring a gift in? When do I do this sort of thing? Um, I think a lot of it is comedic timing. Um, 
And that's something that just sort of gets developed. Like when you when you sense that beat in a scene or you feel like it's coming up to a beat. And so you kind of prepare for that moment. Um, but I think when I am bored, <laughs> honestly, like all those concepts that we just talked about, like point of view and when when you need when you're in a scene and when you need to shift it and when you need to do kind of all of that stuff I think that as you're on the sidelines watching and learn and trying to figure out okay does this scene need me and if I keep going like nope still good still going it's still got energy it's still got perspective it's still got all this stuff um then I I like to leave the scene alone um unless it's like oh you know what would heighten this like this concept that they're bringing in, you know, it would heighten it if I came in as like a producer and just like made a blip about how awesome this person is and how much this person sucks and then just leave. Mm-hmm. And so now they have like, it's adding to what they're doing. I'm not right. removing kind of. Um, yeah. That's or- all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Or like doing cut twos or, you know, painting scenes and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Those are little gifts that you can sprinkle in that you're not necessarily coming in and like taking over the scene, you know? And I think, um, I think it's interesting too, because we were talking about slow and fast improvisation too. Cause you, you, I mean, listen, we're not of all the same brain. We're not of all the same personality. We're not of all the same point of reference uh, in terms of experience. And so, and I think this comes up a lot, especially with um, new players, because you're still trying to also figure out how to be a better improviser. But um, so somebody who might think, oh, this scene needs to be move, moving faster, mm. you know, um, and I've, I've grappled with this sometimes. And I'm again, like I'm saying, I'm like, OK, I got to work on slowing down and also letting a scene breathe because it's not that's not always just because I think it needs to be faster isn't always what needs to happen. You know, so I think that as you're if you are a new improviser and just really paying attention to kind of what you're bringing to the table because sometimes it's nerves Mm. that are getting in my way and and the way I react is like oh I need to fix it and and it's (laughs) like well no like you (laughs) calm the fuck down um (laughs) sorry mom uh and (laughs) uh you know so I think I think that there's uh things you have to sort of check yourself on too and and yeah, that's all I have to say about um, that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, going into that um, kind of brings us into another question I had, which are um, the common pitfalls of a scene. Like, where where are you when you find that you need help in a scene? Mm-hmm. Um, and I wrote down some that I was thinking of. Uh, one being in a, if you're in a negotiation. <sighs> it's so hard one. for me to get out of a negotiation. Um, I have to, like, I feel like I almost have to stop the scene if I'm in a negotiation and be like, we're not talking about this anymore. Um, well, and I actually do that, yeah. but creatively. So um, negotiations are really easy to get into because they're simple and we know how they work, right? Um, but what I always like to ask myself is why are we in this negotiation? And what reason can I give that's ridiculous? Um, and sometimes I will literally stop in. I will force myself to say something and stop in the middle of the sentence, pause and look at that person and be like, this isn't about this, is it? <laughs> like, I know what's I know what's really going on. Yeah. That's a great stop, yeah. stop and make it that climax moment of um, there's something fishy going on here. Mm-hmm. Um because the audience is probably bored too. Mm-hmm. They're like, "Oh, look, they're buying a sandwich. That's neat." Right. But it starts it's, becoming about the thing. It comes about the thing, yeah. but what if the thing is just a uh like a concept from something else that's happening, mm-hmm. right? Like you're buying me the sandwich because you know how I feel about mac and cheese. <laughs> you're doing this on purpose, aren't you? <laughs> and that can, you know, that yeah. can develop out of something cuz in real life, people do that, right? You bought me flowers. All right, why? Why did you buy me flowers? <laughs> what did you do? What did you do? Well, it's it. You know, it kind of reminds me too because um, for a while, my team we were working with this uh, format called we were calling it the spot, and basically the way it worked was like the suggestion from the audience would be like, 
think of a place that has a lot of different places within that place so like an office or like a mall or something like that and Mm -hmm. um to me I I started to sort of resent that format um because you know it kind of it kind of lended itself to constantly be in negotiation because you're at the mall what do you do you go to the mall and you order something for or you're at a shop and you're you don't know the relationship I mean you can still do it to where, but it just seemed like it was easier to just fall into those negotiations. So I kind of like the Rosowski stripped down. I always, I always mention Rosowski in case one time he's on the podcast. The strip, Check. Yeah. I think he's um, in the show notes for every single show. <laughs> we love you. Um, but the thing about him that I love is that it's like there is no place. There's just you and your mannerisms and whatever you're bringing on stage. All Everything else, like he would be like, kind of like is bullshit and doesn't matter so mm-hmm. it's really stripping down to like your character and then the relationship that you have with the, the other person on stage right, right. I mm-hmm. think there's more to it than that but. um another scene I often find myself in that I hate being in is when one person is teaching another person something oh, yeah. and it's just like here you do this I it almost stand it. it almost like strips away my my one of the character's autonomy and to be able to make their own decisions because you're literally telling them what to do um, I, I don't know why teach like negotiations I get because it's just a back and forth and it's not about anything. Well, I guess maybe it's the same thing with teaching scenes in that it becomes about the thing you're teaching and not about the relationship. But Well, I think you hit it on the head there. I think it's you're taking away the freedom from your scene partner mm-hmm. to no longer be a part or contribute to the scene. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if I come in and I'm teaching you how to hit a golf ball, like you no longer... Mm-hmm. have any kind of decision making in this scene I'm telling you what to do how to do it mm-hmm. how to stand how to do everything right. um and, and I think it's the type of negotiation too and, and you're putting yeah. them in an inferior yeah. position on top of it you're like I'm I'm the dominant person in the scene you're my son or my student or whatever do what I say right and they have to either make a choice to rise up and then it just becomes an argument or follow along in which case it just gets boring yeah and I think I think that there's there's potential in those types of scenes it's just Mm -hmm. that you have to be very cognizant of it as soon as possible Mm -hmm. so as soon as you realize okay you're my golf instructor before you say two or three sentences you already have to establish that it's more than than the golf instruction mm-hmm. see that 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 rings a bell for me because i i took a golf class once and i was totally attracted to my golf instructor oh. it was yeah so there's still potential it there thing. it just yeah. you i think you there's a much greater um haste in mm-hmm. in recognizing that as soon as possible yeah and that's when you create that relationship quickly right. and then you start doing something other than oh. teaching yeah. oh good memories okay um (laughs) sorry that was all right that was fun college stuff okay so there was a yeah golf class at college it was amazing okay so someone is not listening and won't let go of their idea that is another scene that i hate being in where you're trying to move the scene along and they're like no this is what the scene's about yeah (laughs) um i have She's a, got a look on her face uh, like, oh my gosh, we're getting into it. <laughs> I have a great friend, um, Lauren. Oh, I love her. She's amazing. And we did improv together in San Diego. And um, she taught me one of the greatest st- on stage things that you can ever do. And that when you find yourself in a position like this and someone won't let go of their idea, Just agree to the nth degree of whatever it is that they're doing and overdo it. (laughs) Over agree to whatever it is that they're doing. Um, Because in a weird way, you end up taking back control of the scene and you both end up um, working together. And so then it's it's less the conflict is not kind of what we've learned conflict is in a Mm -hmm. scene, um, but more of this overly agreeable individual and then that becomes your character's point of view it's just like whatever this person says 
I'm going to agree with it. Even if it seems weird, all right, well, now our reality is the super weird. Mm -hmm. Um, Right, and actually that's interesting because the way that I worded that was someone's not listening and they won't let go of their idea. But if you turn that back on yourself, well, am I not? Yeah, if, if I'm upset that they're not, agreeing to my idea that means I'm doing the same thing so it takes yeah you're right it takes two to make that happen I I wasn't thinking about it that way when I wrote the question I was like I was like yeah I've been in that scene where someone just like I've say keep saying stuff bulldozing you bulldozing me I'm like well am I holding on to my idea too much but also if you're the bulldozer stop it (laughs) right (laughs) just stop um let's take a break here and do another segment let's do our game you want to oh, play a game? Do it. Yeah. Um, Courtney suggested a game. It's a very simple one that we um, that's great for beginners. It's called uh, I you, you. It's like you, we, me, we. You, me, we. You, me, we. You, me, we. Sounds like French. You, me, we. Okay. <laughs> so this is a two-player <laughs> game. So how about we have it be you two, since I'm the one narrating here. Oh. Um, okay. And basically, one person starts. It's our first and time ever playing together. Oh how yeah. do you feel? So <laughs> <laughs> uh, one person starts, they make a you statement, and the other person makes a me statement, that's M-E, and then um, the f- original player makes a we statement of some sort. And um, can you quickly explain the purpose of this game in, in the context of the show? Yeah, I think it's a really good exercise um, because we're talking about what a scene needs and listening. Um, so it's sort of combining those two concepts together. So I'm going to give a gift. They're going to reply by listening to my gift and gifting me as well. And then from those two statements, you can kind of develop, all right, where can the scene go from here? Um, you're, you're developing the relationship with the we statement. Is that? Uh, not necessarily. Um, but you are sort of adding, um, either a heightened concept or, I mean, it's mostly about listening and then adding something to it. Um, and that's all really about, like, when you respond, you should be adding something to a scene. Well, and I feel like those pronouns, too, lend themselves to a relationship. Mm-hmm. We're talking about you and me. Together. Together. <laughs> all right. Um, how about Katie starts? Why don't you do a you initiation? Hey, Joanne. You know, you seem a little off today. I do seem a little off only because I didn't have my morning coffee. Well, we should get some coffee together and talk about what's bothering you. Because I can tell that something's bothering you, Joanne. Keep going. You have the most brilliant eyes I have ever seen. We should be <laughs> me. Try me. Oh, is it me? I'm doing we're, the game we're... wrong. Go. I thought I was supposed. To, you said you, me, and then we. I think I think yeah, it's you, I, you. we. <laughs> Are we doing the game wrong? I think we might be I doing think, it wrong. I think the whole point is is you. It, whether it's I or me. Why don't you guys do it together. <laughs> you know, oh together. my gosh. I'm not I think it's. Out. You no, know what? I'm, I'm not, you know what? This is a great. This is a great moment. It's a learning moment, I feel like, that in improv, accept failure, fail big. And we just failed huge. <laughs> um, and you know what? We're going to pick ourselves up by our bootstraps if you're wearing boots. If not, bra straps. And uh, we're going to do this again. Yeah. Because I think for those of you out there being like, oh, my God, that's not what it's called. Um, <laughs> it's probably you, I, we. Or I, I think it's I, you, we. So like I, okay. that, that, uh, yeah. There you go. I went to the DMV today and it was a blast. Right. Oh, I'm, I'm going, I'm going. You hate going to the DMV. We need to talk more because I can't believe that you thought that that was my perspective of the DMV. I'm just looking out for your best interest. You're a little too conceited to think that, you know, you know what I want. We need counseling, Sharon. 
Yay. Yay. We did it, we did it right. Yay. What? That was yeah. awesome. I feel like we could go back and do IUE like over and over again yeah. for like or a whole scene. Too. No, that's a good, uh... That was fun. I kind of want to play that scene out. Let's go play now. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. You have to You have to do one and then we'll end this segment. Oh, okay. <laughs> a, a do-over? For yeah. You, yeah, but... We Everyone gets a do over. So yeah, so now you get to play it correct. So get to. It's like a whole different game. I know. <laughs> I, you, we. Are you we? Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So, um, I love light bulbs, they're just so inspiring. <laughs> you have no idea how that makes me feel because I got you one for your birthday. We are, like, the most awesome friends ever. I think that we should go celebrate with a Slurpee. (gasps) You know everything about me and everything that I love. We're soulmates, and there's nothing greater that I can say than that we're soulmates. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to (laughs) cry. Oh. And yeah. then it was the best scene I've ever done See, in my whole okay, life. Okay, so in my head, like, right as she said that, like, Katie gets hit by a bus. <laughs> <laughs> and then and the movie Anna. starts. <laughs> Jeez. I love you, Katie. I would never wish that upon you. But it would be really oh, funny in that scene. <laughs> All right. Let's, um, let's keep talking about our topic. Um, does it always have to make sense? Like, if you're trying to change the direction of the scene... Um, does it have to make sense? Like if you, if you, if they've stumbled and the scene is just very confusing, like, and you're trying to get it, do, do you have to take everything that was there and wrap it all up so that everything makes sense? Or can you just pivot? The pivot. Yeah. Yeah. Pivot. I think it doesn't need to make sense right away. Mm-hmm. And if you've been listening to the scene you can bring stuff back that will then justify whatever change or pivot that you made Mm. well what is it i I would say too like what does it mean that a scene makes sense or doesn't make sense like what are we actually talking about there like i mean you've been in those scenes where like nobody's really listening and there's just a bunch of information out there that's kind of been it's like disconnected rolled over and stuff's just dis- disconnected and people are trying to do their own thing and then as a third party coming in trying to save that scene like is it your job essentially to wrap all that up or oh. or you know sometimes scenes just need to end you know yeah. like they they're, yeah, they're not working they and they either need to end or go in a different direction well and i also think you can apply maybe and sometimes in those situations you can apply the um if this true what el- if this is true what else is true mm-hmm. so maybe choose something that somebody has said and then go off of that right yeah i don't know that actually kind of brings me into the next thing i <laughs> um so if you guys ever get a chance to come to Reno and take a class. Um, Ben Craig is one of my favorite teachers. He is um, one of the owners of Reno Improv and amazing. And I took some notes on some things that he said. Um, He's not a sugar coater though. Right. He's Mm -hmm. He's a great guy. I love him. We love him. And he comes from always a place of love, but that is what's great about him. But without (laughs) any sugar at all, not even a grain. Right. He will be like, we need to improve. That's what I, I, I really appreciate that about him. Right. That's my favorite thing. Um, so I wrote some notes and we'll see what Ka- um, what Katie and Courtney think about this. And some some are stuff that I talked with Courtney, so too. So this is stuff that you've learned um, from Ben. Basically. Stuff I've mostly learned from Ben and then also a little some of the stuff I've learned from Courtney because she's like my teacher as well. Oh. Um, <laughs> I'm like I, I fancy her my mentor. Animal. Like, I don't know. Can I say that out loud? To yeah, everyone? that's can fine. You, will, you, will you be my mentor? <laughs> Courtney's my spirit animal. (laughs) Um, So there's a couple things. Courtney already went over the first one. Does the scene have a strong relationship? Is there a clear setting? Um, I think we kind of touched on that a bit, but sometimes you have the relationship, but it's not in context of of where you are um, and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just adding that little bit of information, like, oh, we're... um, 
in a love triangle, but this is, um, you know, band camp or something, you know, like that, that adds different elements that feed into sure. whatever it could be. So, so ask yourself, does this have a set scene have a setting yet? Cause sometimes people go straight for emotion and relationship and they fail to set the scene. Or sometimes the scene too can as help establish the relationship too, I think. Right. Like when I, yeah. that last Saturday, Diana and T Taylor were on stage and Diana was kind of like trying to get Taylor to hear her and Taylor couldn't hear her and so then I came on stage and I said oh look at the babies you know so Diana then became a baby behind you know the glass or whatever and mm -hmm. so that it was sheer genius <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about that but it helped to define the relationship I think that's what I was trying to right um so like Katie said if this is true what else is true so um oh, yeah. you know taking that you know like okay you're um, obviously in a classroom, well, okay, is it a college classroom? Is, you know, is it a philosophy class? Is it what, you know, like, like there's little bits of information that you can add in kind of as you go that kind of make that scene bigger. Um, if, if this is true about a scene, what else is true about it? Um, and it could be, it kind of ties into like, what else could this conversation be about? Like maybe they're being a little vague about something, but like really it's just something ridiculous. Um, I can't give a good example, but someone who's really good about that is Tim Mahoney. Um, go back and watch episode, is it three or four? I think it was three. Tim Mahoney. He was another guest. He was so great. Um, I've seen him do it. Like, we thought that the conversation was about this, but it was kind of a vague conversation. And he was like, this is actually about clown school or something like that it's not an actual well i had a but... scene with with bill on saturday and initially the scene was sort of running into like we were a married couple and we weren't getting along and he just wanted to stick around and blah 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 and he made a poor decision and then at the end of the scene i was like well that's boring you know what he's been interviewing to be my house robot and that's <laughs> and so it oh, ended up so being scary. you know um yeah. Yeah, exactly. It could be about something totally di like if you start with a boring conversation and you're like, this isn't a regular interview at all. You're not an actu actually a human. Yeah. You know, one of my funny. one of my biggest tools that I have used for years and years and years is breaking the audience expectation. Yeah. Um, because the audience is running scenarios in their own mind. Mm. And they've been watching and they're paying attention and they're listening sometimes better than the players. And so you know the the bell game where you say something and ding and then you got to replace it with ding i love that game um just go through all those dings in your head in a millisecond and come up with like you didn't give me ketchup no you didn't give me this ball of yarn mm -hmm. how dare you hand me this bomb whenever we're here you know that kind of thing um and so the whole audience thought that we were a married couple and we were on the verge of divorce because he purchased a talking toilet and it was weird <laughs> But like, you know, scenes overdone, it's sort of boring. Okay, what can you know, what can we do? Okay, change the whole concept altogether. Still keeping being your point of view. Keeping point of view, keeping with the reality of the scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um just a couple more things and then we'll move into the history segment because we're getting short on time. Um my favorite, this like as a new improviser, level two, when I was first learning long form, this like blew my mind. What and I, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but it's called, just called "Here's the Thing." Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, scenes going weird. It's basically getting back to the relationship, but it's just like drop. Just regular life is happening. This is boring. We've established this scene as boring, so let's just throw something in the mix that's not. Just stop the scene in your tracks. You know, that second you have the, the scene sucks feeling and be like, so here's the thing. I've been lying to you for 30 years. I'm actually an alien and I've been taking notes on you. So the only thing I don't, I'm going to push back a little bit because Ben says that all the time and I okay. get it and I, I think it helps. But it means you have to come up with an idea and invent. And mm -hmm. I... I Personally, I'm not great at that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like I have great ideas. I'm, I'm great with emotion and establishing relationships. But so I also like kind of that's good for people who are who can be snappy and come up with with great mm -hmm. ideas. 
But what I like too is, um, I think Courtney said earlier, uh, something like, instead of saying, here's a thing, you could also say, well, you know how I feel about that. Oh, yeah. To me, that's like an alternative way of saying it. And you don't have to invent. It's now becoming more about emotion and relationship. And for me personally, mm -hmm. that that works does that I mean is that kind of like a question though like you know how I feel about that and then it's my job to be like to come up with like not necessarily because yeah. you can agree with the emotion mm -hmm. you don't know why that emotion exists necessarily mm -hmm. but now you're sharing in that moment together and maybe you never actually bring it up but now there's a secret you have and a secret you have and you're both playing on those perspectives and secrets and now everyone's like oh no what is it what is it and be like yeah. you know what we don't know either yeah. but sometimes that creates suspense mm -hmm. and um by the end you're slow down that's my biggest note slow down mm -hmm. because those are the moments where you can use to come up with stuff yes. and run scenarios in your head but you're still being true and to that emotion and you're building that suspense too. exactly so right Interesting. Um, last one is uh, why is that important? We won't go into it that much because we got a good for history segment. But um, just just the last thing that somebody said, why is that important? How can you make that bigger in your mind um, and make a choice based on the last thing that was said? Why is that important? Um, and how does that affect everything that's come before? Um, a yeah. little game I about think that's that. Kind of a little bit like if this is true what else is true a little bit right yeah it's a lot a lot of the same thing um we're gonna jump into our history segment now what do you got yeah. for us Katie? um okay so uh this may not be totally on topic but um i found i always get my history segments from improv nation how we made a great american art by sam watson um so this is talking about the relationship between uh, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. Uh, many of you may know that they were key players in the first group of Saturday Night Live, and uh, they began through improv. And um, before Saturday Night Live happened, kind of a precursor radio show to Saturday Night Live was called um, National Lampoon Radio Hour. Mm. So... Um, Basically, this book describes, and this happened in about in 1974, um, you know, when John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd met each other, um, it was like, and this is quoted, I think, from Belushi saying, um, we took one look at each other and it was love at first sight. <laughs> so, and really what it talks about is their, the chemistry that they had together on stage was just like out of this world. Um, and... Uh, so, and I kind of, I'm just going to, what I like to do is just read a quote, um, and then, and then we can discuss it. Um, so it, this book later, I mean, after talking about sort of their relationship and how, um, how much chemistry they had, they, the, the author, Sam Watson, um, gets a quote from, um, hang on, Winston Marcellus, jazz great Winston Marcellus, talking about jazz, but applying this to improv, so. Um, this is what Winston Marcellus says about jazz, but also something that we can, we can apply to improv. Yes, the real power and innovation of jazz is that a group of people can come together and create art, improvised art, and can negotiate their agendas with each other. And that negotiation is the art. So what I like about this quote is, um, uh, you know, cause and this has just been on my mind. Um, so, you know, we can talk all day about good techniques and how to, you know, um, make a better scene and, and all that stuff. And, and, and that's all very, very important to the art of improv. But I think also um, sometimes that doesn't, something that doesn't get talked about explicitly is the chemistry and whether or not you click with the people that you are in, in with a group. And so some of those techniques can fall flat because you're not clicking with each other. And so, I don't know, I guess the question is, um, you know, what do you guys think about um, how, is it, is that, is, is, do you just need that chemistry or is there something that you can do as a group to kind of foster that chemistry or make, make it 
so that you guys are clicking more on stage? What do you guys think? I think another word for chemistry is just simply trusting each other. Yeah. Um, you know, I can be on stage with people who I might, th their style is really strange to work with me. Um, because like you said, we all have different backgrounds. We all have different styles, techniques. Um, but ultimately it all comes down to, do we trust each other? Do I trust that if there's a bit really big silence on stage that I know the way that you work and I understand your style and technique that I can trust that I can be quiet and shut up and wait for you to say something or give me something. Um, and I think it is the most important thing. Um, I know really, really strong improvisers that I think are really brilliant and amazing, but I don't trust them. I don't know them. I haven't worked with them. Um, and so the scene sort of goes nowhere because it's kind of like, well, I don't really know you or trust you or, or whatever. Um, and there's people that I've never worked with, but I'm really good friends with them. And I know that if we were ever on stage together, Katie, <laughs> that we would work well together because I, I trust you as a person and as a friend um, and not worry about our scene falling flat or going weird. And even if it does, then we're going to have a good time yeah. doing it. Yeah, I, um, I kind of feel like a huge skill in improv is just that skill of letting things slide off your back. Mm -hmm. um, and in the real world, too, it's helped me out. Like, usually I'll take stuff and be like, oh, that was wrong, and I'll dwell on it. Um, so beyond just trusting the other player, um, being able to trust yourself to just be present and enjoy the scene and not get caught up on things mm -hmm. is going to help you have chemistry with anybody that you're on stage with. And just, just accepting that the person that you're with is the person that you're with mm -hmm. and they, um, they're human too. They're going to make mistakes just like you do. Mm -hmm. Um, and kind of having that confidence in yourself makes you, you know, I'm kind of, preaching but not necessarily practicing <laughs> but well, it's a work in progress. all the time all but in progress. And I think right. I think that that you know to me that that also demonstrates um you know being being honest with yourself you mm -hmm. know and and really understanding what you struggle with and sort of the things that, you know the ways that you mess up on stage or maybe you know you didn't support your partner scene partner as much as you would have liked and you know, really looking at that and really um, not being overcritical of yourself because, you know, we all make mistakes and that's fine. Right. Um, but kind of being honest with yourself. I think that mm -hmm. that and I think maybe I don't know what you guys is, you know, maybe within your group, too, if you can have that honesty um, on your team to be like, hey, we're all just working on this and not to take anything personally, too. I mean, that's that's the constant reminder, too, is that we're all we're all working on a craft. We're not. Right. You know, we're all actors. It's not about, you know. Right. Well, I bet there, as as I say that, too, I also do it with a disclaimer, is there is some, some people who you work with over and over and over again. You have those discussions. You have those notes, and they just don't get it. Mm -hmm. And they don't they don't change. And you, you might start from a place of trust, and then they lose that trust because they're not growing with you or they're choosing mm -hmm. just to stay in their comfort zone and not – not improve and that makes I don't know what what happens when you're in that situation <laughs> I don't know yeah. Um, yeah well I mean so. I think everybody you know I mean gr I guess grows at their own pace and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know I, I think that that's I mean to me that's that's a thing too is that it comes down to group dynamics and um, because I've seen people that or worked with people on stage like kind of Courtney what Courtney was saying where it's like Oh, I really like this person and I get along with them off stage. But when we're on stage, it's like there's just something missing. It just doesn't click. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that might not be for any other reason except for, you know, because I sometimes I see, I, I'll see those people with other people on stage. And I'm like, wow, they really came out and did things that I didn't think that they could do. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not about, you know, them necessarily not growing enough or not. But maybe they're, you know. Maybe maybe there was something about me that made them feel either inhibited or, you know, we're just not clicking or whatever. And so I think, um, you know, I, I don't know. It's all about complimenting. 
you know, mm-hmm. and and I think like we were talking about what does the scene need? Sometimes a certain player, you just don't compliment them mm-hmm. well. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't compliment everybody right. and a lot of people don't compliment me. Mm-hmm. And knowing that um, I can do one of two things. I can I can ignore it and I can be like, well, oh, well, I'm just going to still do me. Or I can look at that situation and look at somebody that I don't compliment and be like, what is um, what is a technique that I need to grow and need to exercise that technique muscle and and practice and force myself on stage with that person and be like, okay, how do they play and how can I compliment them? Mm. And now now I'm growing as an improviser mm. yeah, that's and becoming more versatile. Yeah, mm. that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, I think, to look at it as a challenge of like, okay, well, how, and of course we're not talking about compliments, like you look nice today. <laughs> we're talking about making the other person look good and you know, vice versa. Vice versa. Mm-hmm. And how can you, how can you get, come up with gifts that maybe you don't naturally do on stage, but then you're like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I totally like that. I tell my three year old son, you can't control what other people do, but you can control how you react Absolutely. to it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that's how you become better. That's awesome. Um, awesome. Great history segment. Um, we're going to start wrapping up now. Um, but before we do, um, I am going to ask Courtney, is there anything left over that I didn't quite ask you? Um, any last words about, you know, how how do you make that seem better? I think um, I think the biggest thing that you can take with you that's very simple and precise is when you come into a scene, um, ask yourself if you can do one of two things. Should I join? Should I join it or contrast it? And that's referring to whether that's the emotion, whether that's the um, the uh, agree- being agreeable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if someone is on stage and they're just huffing and puffing and they're angry and that's where they're starting their emotion at, I can come on stage, either join them and also be huffing and puffing and be angry about it, or I can come in and contrast that with a completely different emotion. Um, And that, for me, is where I like to start, is am I going to join this person or am I going to contrast this person? Mm -hmm. It's a quick little tool to put in your tool belt. I like that. Um. Awesome. Um, so, uh, final question of the day. Um, I didn't write one, so let's, oh. so let's make one up <laughs> off the spot. Um, final question of the day. It doesn't exist. What? What, looking back at your life as oh. a whole, if your life wow. were to, if your life were to flash before your eyes mm-hmm. right now, you were gonna we're die. To Poof. Fire <laughs> no, that's your thing, Katie. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's my thing. <laughs> um, <I don't> either. <laughs> <laughs> what is one thing that you would change today and do differently? Oh my God. <laughs> this has nothing to do with improv. Uh, it's not supposed to. Okay, you want to. You want to. Oh, serious it's not supposed. To, it's not supposed um, to have. Okay. Oh, okay. I could do a less serious and like really stupid one, but yeah, because that's a really long answer. Let's like, wow, like go get coffee. <laughs> I know, <let's laughs> need to go. assess this. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. What uh, What color is your aura? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> like, it's whatever you want. Okay, I can't. You come up with one. Gosh. Um. Uh, let's see. If you could be um a type of if you could. <laughs> we are amazing improvisers. If, if you could come up with a question for okay. on the spot, what would it be? <laughs> this, this would be my question for myself. Te- piggybacking off of what you were saying. If I was to look back on my life and my life flashed before my eyes, what would it look like if I didn't have improv in it? <gasps> dun, dun. You're welcome. <laughs> um, 
That's a great question. <laughs> And I'm going to answer it really hard on it. Yeah. Um, And I'm going to answer it this way. I think I think it would be um, I think because of improv, I was in the military for six and a half years. I was a combat photographer, videographer, and um, I worked at the Pentagon. I've been deployed and uh, I've moved a lot. I've also I've moved 43 times. And I've lived in 15 different states. And I think that improv had a huge, played a huge role in um, my confidence in um, jumping into uh, situations that were either uncomfortable or unfamiliar for me. Um, Because that's what improv really does, is it throws you into a situation, you know nothing about it, you don't know who you're going to be in the scene with, you don't know what they're going to say, you don't know anything, and yet you are you have the confidence and you already know going in that I'm going to be a part of this thing. And I think in life in general, when you're thinking about um, auditioning for that play for the first time, or you're wanting to... Um, work on a project that you've been had a dream about or you're going into uh, an interview or talking to someone or you feel compelled to talk to that person on the street because you just know it's going to make their day or whatever improv gives you the confidence and the I think makes you brave to jump into those things and um, I'm thankful for improv in that way because it has afforded me the opportunity to to jump into things that I wanted to do. That's awesome. Aww. That's a great note to end I on. I love Yay. it. Thank you, Courtney. For the love You're of welcome. improv. You're welcome. For the love of improv. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, quick same, shameless promotion. If people were to look up Courtney Rapp, they're trying to figure out what you're doing. They want to be involved in um, all things Courtney. Where do they go? What do they look for? Uh, the people? best place is on Instagram at court, court, OA. Um, and keep up there. Um, I also am the media director over at Good Luck Macbeth Theater, and I'm going to be in a couple sketch shows and a couple more plays. So definitely look that up. Also, this Saturday I will be on stage, and so you sh- I think we're all going to be on stage actually. Yeah. So yeah. Scramble at, Reno at Reno Improv, Improv eight yeah. o'clock. Five dollar. Yeah. Check us out. Hire me. I take pictures. Yes. Um. Awesome. Um, Can I yeah. Do this shameless plug too. Please, please. We have no money for marketing. Um, <laughs> so I took a sketch class with um, Jason S. S. <laughs> Sarna. He's great. Jason Sarna, who I love. He's an amazing teacher. Um, and from Reno Improv. And uh, it's a year long class. We wrote many different sketches. We then narrowed it down to one. We auditioned actors, we directed them, uh, we're in our last two rehearsals, and now we're going to present our sketch class, which is called Herd, I mean, sketch show, which is called Herd Immunity, which is happening starting uh, November 23rd, and then three more Saturdays after that, same show. Um, So, hope you guys can make it out to Reno Improv. Oh my gosh, such great stuff, we will put it all in the show notes, all of the stuff, you'll be able to go to so many things. Um, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of For the Love of Improv. Um, please go to our website and make comments if you have any questions or ideas for future shows. Um, if you yourself would like to be on the show, send us a message. We are always looking for new guests and new ideas. And thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Come on, ladies. Love of improv, improv. Improv.